Are we ready to go? I'm ready. Okay, good. Well, we're really happy to have Melissa Fox here tonight with us. Melissa's gonna talk about the importance of down ballot elections, uh, city councils, or educate, board of education, county offices, and why it's important to get Democrats elected into those positions. And how do we find those candidates? And once we do, how do we get them elected? So she's, um, Melissa's practiced law in Orange County for over 20 years. She was elected in November 2016 to the Irvine City Council. And she's going to run um, this November for the uh, California 68th Assembly District. She's going to run against Republican Stephen Choi. Um, Melissa is a past president of the California National Women's Political Caucus. She serves on the board of multiple organizations. Um, she's certainly knowledgeable about campaigning for local offices. And Melissa is an avid gamer. She used to be a park ranger. <laughs> and uh, she's owned by a dog named Chief, a husky. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you so much. Appreciate you coming. Well, I am super excited to be here. Uh, one of my passions has been helping women get elected to office. And it is so great to see so many women on this call. Um, now, I love the fellows too, and there certainly are, are many great men out there, but there are not enough women in politics and it ever since, gosh, for the past decade, it's been important to me to train, finance, uh, support, and elect democratic pro-choice women. And there's a number of uh, organizations that will do that, that we can talk about a little bit later. I'm really excited. So first of all, thank you for having me on. I have learned about this club really only in the last year, and it is so impressive. Um, from the very first meeting when um, Vivian's energy really just rocked the whole room, and then you guys moved directly into activism. Um, one of the things that I sometimes get a little frustrated at is when we all come together as a group to talk about issues. And that's wonderful, but it is nowhere near enough. I mean, the, having to do uh, do things, you know, to me is the foundation of our democracy. And even if it's just getting one other person to vote, right? But I mean, ideally we should be all working together. So I'm really excited to talk about this. And I have three basic topics that I thought I'd bring to the table today. Basically why? Right? Why is it so important to get um, locals elected? Um, how and who? So the why. I don't think in my lifetime it has ever been so important to elect good people to local office. And so what are we defining as local office? I'm presuming... Um, I don't wanna presume that we all are on the same page, but we're talking about school boards. We're talking about water boards. We're talking about assessors. And we're talking about uh, certainly city government. And um, this is just incredibly important. And I have to admit, even though I've been in and around, actively in and around politics for over a decade, I had no concrete understanding of how important it was until I was elected. So basically, it's all about money, power, and your health and welfare. So what kind of money are we talking about for local electeds, right? I mean, we know, for example, the governor announced today that there is the potential of a $55 billion hole or deficit in the coming year. And that's just an enormous number, right? But it doesn't, it doesn't translate uh, down down ballot, right? There's we're going to have huge deficits as well. So what what kind of money do you think that um, our local elected electeds are handling? And I can just off the top of uh, my head tell you about Irvine. Um, Irvine 
uh, has $2 billion in assets and a general fund. So just the amount, you know, just our checking account basically of 200 million uh, plus other funds for construction and other obligations. And we award multi-million dollar contracts and our decisions um, cost or make companies millions of dollars on a regular basis, like every meeting. Some decisions as much as billions of dollars. And you know, to some extent, that's why we have um, so much power coming into elections from corporations is because they stand to benefit from these contracts or be harmed from the, the regulations that we pass. Now, that's just city of Irvine, right? Irvine Unified School District's general fund budget is double Irvine's budget, right? So imagine, so that's about 200, I'm sorry, $400 million a year. Right. And that is a tremendous amount of power and influence. So um, that's pretty, pretty obvious, right? But what about our health and welfare, like the direct relationship of health and welfare? Well, COVID-19 really gives us the tools to understand this right now. Look at the Board of Supervisors. Our businesses are opening not because they have been granted the, the right to go against the state's uh, shelter in place ordinance, but just the mixed message from the board of supervisors where they said, we flattened the curve, we're ready to move on. So just their intimation that we might be ready to open has caused other uh, businesses to be confused and they start opening. And that has a tremendous impact on our health. And I have been um, contacted from local businesses and restaurants, but even down to the farmer's market where they say, hey, can we now go out and eat in the park? You know, what, what are we allowed to do? And so just the uh, off the hand, off hand cuff, off the cuff or off hand remarks of the Board of Supervisors throws all of our health and welfare, you know, in, into, uh, um, into play. So we know that we uh, our deaths are increasing. Fortunately, today we did have only one. Yesterday there were five. The day before there were four. The day before that there were four. We've had an increase in hospitalizations and we've had an increase in the transmission rates. So our supervisors are really setting a lot of the policy and our cities are following their lead. Um, now, another part of the COVID-19 picture uh, is Cities that have fewer than 500,000 people do not benefit from the CARES Act fund directly. So what that means is that the Board of Supervisors controls 538 million of CARES Act money that's going to be coming to our county. So why, why is that of concern? Well, we know that what they've done in the past in 2017, in the midst of the homelessness crisis, they walked away from hundreds of millions of dollars in funds that were available for grants uh, to fight homelessness. They left hundreds of millions of dollars on the table. Of the millions of dollars that they had in their coffers, which were to be expended on homelessness, they used that only for the interest. They never actually spent it. They added the interest to the general fund. So this, not using those funds to fight homelessness, I think if you've lived in our county has been a huge issue over the past three years. Um, so our businesses and our beaches are we're opening prematurely. Um, the Board of Supervisors uh, also pay most of our in-home healthcare services through the county, right? They, at this point, have said that they will only issue the PPE, which they receive from the state, if the in-home health care worker will certify that either they have COVID-19, they've tested positive, or their client has COVID-19. That is uh, not the right order of doing things. So th these are all going to have direct effect 
on our health and welfare. And never mind that we have a Newport Beach council member who's actually suing our governor. So it should be clear how there's a direct effect on all of our lives based on who we elect to these very important positions. Now, what I really didn't understand fully until I myself was elected are the indirect effects of local office. We all sit on boards that drive not just city policy, not just regional policy, but state and federal policy. For example, Orange County Transit Authority. If you don't support transit and you sit on the Orange County Transit Authority, you're not going to be applying for grants for transit, right? You're going to be trying to apply it to toll roads, right? Um, CTA is another, the, the, um, toll, the toll authority. Uh, Southern California Association of Governments, known as SCAG. League of Cities. Water boards, Orange County Fire Authority, sanitation boards, AQMD. Now, all of the people who sit on these boards individually express their opinions on issues and put together craft policy letters. But in addition to that, they all hire lobbyists who then will travel to um, Washington, D.C. or Sacramento and state the position of their entire region. So for example, when I served on the Newport Bay um, executive board for the Newport Bay watershed, we had a climate change denier who routinely pushed back against any funding for desediment and, and seagrass, right? I mean, and challenged the reports. These are huge, of huge importance in our daily lives. And, you know, we have toll roads over transit based on the people that we've elected in the past. Um, so hopefully you can see, so this is my argument for why this is so important. Uh, now, the next question is how, right? So like any other industry, campaigning and every job within a campaign has skills that can be learned, improved on and perfected. So while sometimes it's better to be lucky than good in real life and in campaigns, you can always improve your odds by improving your skills. And winning is not really magic. It's just math and hard work. Um, I volunteered on various campaigns in the 2008 cycle. And after it was over, I was appointed to the OC Central Committee. And then I ran for and was elected to be an assembly delegate. So at that time, I had absolutely no idea what that entailed. At my first uh, convention in Sacramento, I decided to run for a 12 plus Republican assembly seat. Now, I absolutely had no idea what I had gotten myself into there either, as Louise, I'm sure, remembers, because I was running to represent her. And in fact, at that time, I didn't even know what 12 plus R cook index was, which is a good thing. I might not have done it. <laughs> now, almost immediately after, well, first of all, let me back up. I ran for a seat that was very similar to the seat that I'm uh, running in now. And it, but the timing was much more, um, unfavorable. So we had just come off a national election with Obama. And so I was looking at running in a district that Obama had won. And therefore, my logic was, well, if Obama had won it, then I could win it. And you know, with a little bit of luck, we could have won. We outperformed registration by a lot. But luck was not, you know, running in 2010. As a matter of fact, we had tremendous headwinds. Uh, now we're in a totally different cycle now. Well, not only are we in a totally different cycle, but my registration is now, um, my opponent only has a 1% advantage. Um, when we started this race in January of 2019, he had a 7% advantage. And when I ran for this seat in 2010, it was a 12% advantage. And in 2012, after redistricting so that it 
drew the boundaries for what I'm looking at now it was an 18% advantage. So timing absolutely means a lot. And I wouldn't, I, the fact that I ran, I, the only day I think I ever regretted running was the day after the election. <laughs> But immediately, you know, and not even the whole day, because that day I then had my campaign um, advisors who were two young Filipino women, one who had just graduated from law school and one who had just graduated from Berkeley. They both kind of snuck in to my house because because that was my campaign headquarters. They opened the door, didn't knock because that's the kind of friends you make on a campaign. And they each sat down on they came in like within 20 minutes each other, they took one end of the couch and we just sat some like runway show. And, uh, and now both those women are uh, in politics. One is uh, a consultant and has been, and they've both been in politics for um, the past 10 years. And before they had never done anything political. So I don't regret for a moment running because I learned how to run. Uh, but the first thing that I had to do was decide that I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So almost immediately after deciding to run, I attended a week-long campaign academy in fabulous Beaumont. So not the most exciting California town. And my husband and I went together. and We had no idea what to expect. So we pulled off the, uh, the tent. And we pulled into our room that looked right onto the I-10 freeway and checked in and we proceeded to have one of the best weekends of our lives. We made great friends, including now assembly member Jose Medina. And we had a blast all the while learning more than we could ever have hoped in two days. And I still use everything that uh, I learned that weekend on every single campaign. And I, I actually have somewhere, well, I have, I have that binder that I got that weekend and I, oh, here it is. And I give it out very lovingly. It's like very well worn and I lend it, but I make sure and get it back. So fabulous resource. Now, we, what did we learn? We learned about goals, strategies, tactics, timelines, benchmarks. We learned how to manage a campaign's most crucial resources, people, money, and time. Uh, we learned the structure of an electoral campaign, including the candidate, the manager, the consultant, the organizer, communications, fundraising, volunteers. We learned how to develop a message and communicate it, the message box and how to use it. We learned about campaign math, right? Your win number, calculating democratic performance, calculating persuadable voters, calculating where to find them, figuring out how much money you need to raise, from where, what do you spend it on? Now these are all, there are all kinds of resources for learning these skills, uh, but first thing you have to know is you're not winging it, don't wing it. There's answers for all of this, right? And you know, sometimes they're not even the same, but guaranteed there's an answer for you. So we have all of these resources. Now, what was um, very helpful to me was other women. Um, in particular, State Treasurer Fiona Ma uh, reached out to me. She was the assembly whip and she helped me run. Uh, also state, uh, state controller, Betty Yee was very, now they were not in these positions at the time, right? Fiona was the whip for the assembly. Betty was on the board of equalization. Um, Nancy Skinner was just in the assembly. Uh, but the women were the ones who really picked me up. Now I found that it was very important to have an affinity group and women were my affinity, right? But there's great resources for people of color. There's great resources for millennials, not just in training, but also in groups out there. And there's, um, you know, the old boy network is alive and, and uh, well, right? And I, for example, I, uh, I share a fundraiser with the mayor of Walnut, who's running for an assembly seat. Great guy, we endorsed each other. We've been friends all the way through. But I'll tell you, 
there are people who will take his call and who and who gave money to him immediately that threw hoops for me to jump through. Now, granted, there were some women that, you know, supported me faster than they supported Andrew, but really take advantage of your affinity groups because, you know, they get you, right? Um, and they're probably going to be less um, put off by grandchildren in the picture or children or dogs or whatever we women, you know, have in our lives that men um, aren't, that aren't as prevalent in men's lives. But um, so use your affinity, especially there's some great groups for Asian Pacific Islanders as well. And so there's a lot of those groups out there. All it is is a Google search. But the best resource for me was um, actually people. So I had a campaign manager in my first campaign who taught me absolutely everything. He was an amazing man. He was the former mayor of uh, Fountain Valley. He had been a Republican and he had changed his party. And he and I had no idea. I actually met him in the Democratic Party. And um, he was a staunch progressive. And his name was Gus Ayer. I know Louise probably remembers Gus. And he um, just gave his heart and soul, his time and his treasure to my campaign. And I remember at one point I asked him for help with something. And he goes, Melissa, I have spent so much that I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to be in violating finance if I do one more thing. I'm like, oh, no, we didn't. We don't want to do that. Right. But um, his dedication really helped me. And I know I have gone. Um, out of my way or, or to try and reach my hand out and help other people because I think that that really makes a difference. Appointing people who want to run to other positions. So now I'll say anyone who is interested in learning how to fundraise or, or anything, call me. Well, you can do call time um, on my face. You'll FaceTime while we call time. I'm always willing to show people how to do it. Um, uh, Meredith can put my cell number in the chat so that it's available, but call me. I'm passionate about helping get Democrats elected because I know what it's like to work with people who do not share my ideals and um, who don't want to support um, moratorium against eviction and who don't want to help the homeless and who don't have just the same kind of focus that we have and we need more. Um, so I left a list of resources, I think that I sent ahead of time. And what I did was I put together, um, now I use Democracy for America. I don't think they're doing in-person anymore, but they have night school online. Um, there's also right now, I think the best thing that I found was um, traindemocrats.org and it's the National Democratic Training Committee. And that's been really, really good uh, for online and I put a list of books about a page long and a list of organizations to get you guys started. Now, mine is skewed toward women because that's what I know. Now, who should be involved, right? Don't ask Joe Schmo to work on your campaign, right? I mean, you really, we are not normal people. We are not normal. Right. So so uh, I thought I found it really interesting when they said raise money from your friends. Uh, he was like, oh, no, you know, that's a great idea if you have Democratic activist friends. But I found that, um, you know, I asked them all, by the way, I, I asked them all to find out if they had any interest in politics. But at that time, I, I mean, between now and when I first ran, I have an entirely different group of friends. <laughs> we just, you know, especially now in the days of such polarization. Um, and I, I talked with um, Treasurer Ma about this as well. I mean, my best friend has nothing to do with politics, hates politics, and she's the only one who survived the cut, right? But, you know, if you're not gonna come to a political event with me, I'll probably never see you, you know? So we are not normal. We're not normal, and I know you're not normal because you're on this call, right? 58% of Americans even vote, right? 42% vote for offices other than the president. 
So they're not even voting except every four years, right? 8% of Americans have volunteered for campaigns. Now, less than 1% of Americans donate to electoral campaigns. So people, we are not normal, <laughs> but that's okay because we know that it doesn't take really that many people to run a successful campaign. It doesn't take that many donors. You'd be surprised. You know, I'm not getting money from, you know, 50 cents from, a, from you know, the nation, right? This is not like a Bernie Sanders campaign. Basically, there are political donors, there are political activists, and it doesn't mean, though, that you forget those people, right? Because you want their vote, right? You want them to understand your issues. Maybe they want, you want them to, re, uh, um, you know, and that's another thing. When we're talking to regular people, we have to understand that they are not, you know, coming from the same place that we are. So when you're looking for campaign staff, or when you're looking for a campaign candidate, the first place I think we should look is to campaign volunteers because they are already in, you know, self-selected to that 8% who care, right? Who care enough to have even picked up the phone, to even be on this call, to even show up to a meeting, right? So that's a really great place to start. Now, I'm not saying, you know, write everyone off, but, but, you need to have someone who likes people, right? And this is true from the candidate on down to the data person, because it is very much a, a people-based business. So I look typically to PTA or PTO because those people can run the world, right? I mean, look around the room, right? And look for the person who is always doing everything. Right. So if you want something done, ask a busy person. Well, that's exactly the, it holds true here. So um, it's hard work uh, and you should ask people who are used to it. Um, and it requires a lot of selflessness. So even if um, they haven't thought about politics before, you know, you can always get like a PTA or a PTO. Great. A great. Um, Outreach can be, I really need your help on my race for school board because we need to really send uh, a strong message on X, Y, Z issue, right? And so you can rope them in on an issue. Uh, now, if there is a hot button issue in the community, uh, then that is a great way to start getting people to knock doors. Um, turning the Great Park, uh, it was originally slated to be an airport and there was a huge campaign. And that is how Beth Crom got pulled into politics and ultimately to the city council and then the mayor. And she had a fabulous 12 year career, um, all based on an initiative and an ordinance. But um, before that, she taught kindergarten. Now, also Rotary members, people who are already giving to the community, already going to those meetings, you know, um, Realtors are fabulous because they know everything that's going on in their neighborhoods and they're very wonderful to recruit um, and they know how to put a sign out. Right. <laughs> and that is not a little thing. Right. I used to have um, a woman who's now in her 80s who is a lawyer and uh, a, um, a realtor. And actually, she escaped Vietnam from the roof of the American embassy. And she's a really an amazing woman. She comes up to my elbow. And uh, for three campaigns, she walked precincts and, and just would plant my signs everywhere, right? And, she's, and, and she also gave me a lot of great life advice and is a good friend. But realtors know the issues in the neighborhood and they talk to a lot of people. So uh, realtors are great. Lawyers, because they're used to public speaking, um, we probably already thought about that. And salespeople. I mean, I want Vivian to run for something. She's amazing, right? <laughs> uh, so every time that you're in an event, right, you want to look for the person who's doing everything and find, you know, find people who are passionate even about one issue, climate change, right, gun control, uh, 
Um, these are people who, even if they themselves don't want to run, they can, they have a group of people that they're talking to, and they could be great at fundraising, right? They could put together an event. Now, I know that the Canyon Dems knows how to put together an event, right? I've seen your events. They're terrific. Well, and I know that, so um, I, I put together just a couple of quick forms that I thought were easy. Now, I have multiple um, handbooks. So if you ever need anything, check with me, see if I can get it to you. But I know Louise probably has the same uh, uh, stash in her filing cabinet, but I put together um, a political campaign launch quick checklist. And, you know, it's just something that you can pull down, uh, make sure that you're covering everything on an event. And then I did an event checklist, which is also NWPC. And a, and a campaign budget. This is a bare bones budget. If you want a real statewide uh, budget or a million dollar campaign budget, I'd be happy to share that as well. But if you're looking at something that's like local, um, then this the, the documents that I sent should should serve you. But you know you need to think about how much you need and um, where you're going to get it and how you're gonna spend it. And again, all of this is on online. So I know that there are people here who have spent time on campaigns and Barbara's elected. So I know she did all that hard work. Um, so I, I, I can talk about a lot of different stuff, but I don't want to uh, talk about things that you already think, you know, no. So is it, if, can, let me take a look at the, is there anything in chat, Meredith, any questions? I can't, it's frozen. <laughs> My okay. chat is frozen, so you'll have um, to tell me. No no specific questions uh, oh, that I'm seeing. I posted Melissa's cell phone number and her uh, email, um, but please put, put any questions in there that you have. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, the, the mystery of fundraising. And I'll tell you, I feel like I just kind of cracked it this year. I spend 10 hours a week fundraising. I do nine of them with um, my local fundraiser. And I do one with my Sacramento fundraiser. And especially in this time, I have really begun to look forward to that fundraising. Because, um, you know, and cold calls are really, really, really hard. Uh, but I don't. I don't look at it as calling people to ask for money. I call, I call to ask people how they're doing and what do they need and how I can help them. And that has just been fabulous. So I get to spend hours on the phone checking up with people I care about. So I've been, I've been calling like the nurses, right? And saying, what's going on on the front lines? I've been calling the grocery workers and to find out, you know, um, and then when I start calling my donors again, it's great because now it didn't start out this way, but now I have established relationships with people um, who are really into the same things that I am taking my seat, the seat that I'm running for back from a pro-Trump uh, assembly member, uh, fighting climate change, you know, fighting for the rights of workers and a better economy. Uh, and so I just call and say, how's it going? You know, what are, what can we do together? It didn't start that way, but that was, you know, I never at any time felt shy about asking for money, right? Because I'm not asking you for money, you know? And I know um, I'm asking you to help me support a cause that we both believe in, right? I'm saying, we got to get this guy out. How are we going to do it? And I need your help. So how do we talk new people into running for the first time? Well, you know, I think anytime somebody says to me, oh yeah, I, I always, I kind of used to think I might want to run. Like you're hooked, you're in, you're done, show up, let's talk. What do you want? Let me appoint you. I mean, I just grab them, <laughs> right? And um, to say, if you've thought about it, that's enough, right? Um, the I have heard many times that women are sitting around waiting to be asked, right? Um, I guess that's true, but I've asked plenty of women to run and it doesn't always work, you know? Like you, like, you should run, you should run. Like, yeah, I'm not doing that, uh, not my time in life. So mm -hmm. to me, I think the best way to get someone to run is to get them to work on another campaign, right? So um, 
let me put out there Meredith Marquis, who's on this call. Meredith was a volunteer um, with the Katrina Foley campaign. And then she started doing a little volunteering on Lauren's campaign. And then she was volunteering on my campaign. And then um, I hired her. And I don't remember which happened first, but then I said, you should run, right? And so the next thing I know, um, she's running for the 68th assembly district and she, um, for, a, for a position on um, assembly, del or on the central committee. Yeah, and she put her name on the ballot in the primary and she did very, very well for a first time candidate. Now, I had the ability to say, if you don't win, I will appoint you. And so I will be appointing her and then she will, her name will get out there and then she will run again and then she will win. And I'm hoping that she will do what I did, which is run for a central committee and then run for assembly delegate and then run for maybe something else, right? So you <laughs> just the, get them in the water. You know, there's two kinds of people, right? I was the kind of people who jumped into the deep end, freezing cold water, get it over with, let's go. Right. But not everybody is like that. Meredith was more the toe in the water. And then I got to tell you, she printed her own palm cards. She really got into it. You know, she made her own phone calls. So to me, that has been really helpful is to get people involved to see what's in it, because it's been um, kind of heartbreaking for me to see people run and then disappear. Right. Like, I'll tell you, when you're running for office, nobody gives you anything, right? It's not like, so when people say, you know, women are waiting to be asked, um, well, I think men are waiting to be asked too, but the people who are expecting somebody else to do all that hard work for them are not successful, right? Uh, you Even Don Wagner, our board of supervisor, who has had an easier time than most in elections, fought for his life against Ashley Aiken, right? So nothing was even handed to him. He was, a, I've never seen Don work harder in my life, actually. So even he, the broiest of bros, you know, the silver spoon candidate, if there was one, had to work. So it's not easy. And if you have someone, so you have to tell them, you know, it's, it's the hardest job you'll ever love, you know? I mean, it, it's amazing to, well, for example, for me and Meredith, right? To spend our day putting together thousands of pounds of food for campesinos and being able to do all of that just from making some phone calls to actually feed people and make a difference in their lives. Like you don't get that opportunity every day. So yeah. I would say that those are some really great ways to get people to run is to get them in the um, in the campaign. Melissa? Yeah. Um, thank you. You're on a roll. I want to ask you, <laughs> I want to jump in, in here to the chat. And um, there is a question. How do you balance running and fundraising when things are so crazy right now? Yeah, well, I'll tell you in campaigns, things are always crazy. Um, that's why the three biggest resources um, are money and the candidate's time and, uh, or, I'm sorry, people, right, volunteers, um, money and just time, not the candidate's time, but the calendar, right? You only have, the, the one thing that you never get more of is days before the election. Uh, so in my mind, and I've lost two elections and I'm about to win my second election. Um, every time I, can, I know that I have to be able to say I did absolutely everything that I could do uh, short of making myself sick, right? Like there are some days, and well, maybe sometimes not always short of it, but there are some <laughs> days when um, I just have to call it. I just have to say, I cannot talk to a person. I'm going to stay under, under the covers. I'm going to play video games, you know? <laughs> um, and it doesn't happen very often, but I do have to listen to myself. And how do I balance it is like um, every high performing person, I have a very strict calendar. 
Um, you know, calendar, calendar, calendar. We actually had this discussion today. Um, I have two calendars. I have my city, well, I have three calendars. The two that take precedence, I mean, I have a job too. So I have, you know, sometimes things I can't move around. Uh, but I have a city calendar. I have a campaign calendar. And when I make a commitment, it goes on the calendar and it stays there. And so I think that's why I've really been enjoying fundraising because it's a real comfortable time where I can just take my time, talk to my fundraiser and make just spiral through all those calls and ask people how you're doing. Um, but you have to, because you have to keep your commitments, right? If you can't keep your commitment to show up, how are you going to be an elected? You know, mm -hmm. so calendar, calendar, calendar. Um, Barbara, Barbara had a comment that I just wanted to make sure that um, I read to you. And she said that, Barbara said that staying positive is so important through the entire race. Fundraising, of course, is so important. And she found that speaking with small groups of people helps so much in house chats. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, where do you get your energy? You know, and, and I get a lot of energy from these kinds of calls. These calls have been great. You know, interacting with people like this has been giving me a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. But in particular, in the beginning of COVID, when things were really, really scary, I said, you know, I said to my fundraiser, I said, I can't call today. I said, even to check in on people, I said, I am, you know, I just spent the whole day going through uh, layoff notices called war notices, helping someone get evicted, you know, from getting evicted and, and helping people like, deal with just food and you know talking to someone who's just had a stroke who's terrified that the Irvine company is throwing them out and you know he's sending me the eviction papers um days like that I just got to take care of myself and I said I can't you know and there that's why I do see and this is why I do 10 hours of calling because there are weeks that I say, oh my gosh, I have this city hall emergency. I have to carve out that time and I can take it away from fundraising because I'm already doing double what most people do. Most people do about five or six hours. I do 10. So, and I do that because in case there's an emergency or because fundraising requires a good positive attitude. And if I don't have it, I'm not going to fake it. I, I really stink at faking it. So, <laughs> and, um, so, I think like just, just being positive and taking our energy from people. And I have around me people that I love. Um, I work with people in my campaign who I absolutely love and who are so, they add so much to my life in every single way um, because of their political views, uh, because of their energy. I have a very, very diverse um, crew, uh, age, orientation, color, you know, we try and bring around us people who are different than us um, in that so that we can suck all their energy out actually. <laughs> but we, we thrive on each other and um, we have to be able to look forward to that morning Zoom call. And uh, we did, uh, what did we do? Well, like for a couple of days and we're getting together on Zoom now. We, we had an office where we were all like just in a giant horseshoe and we all sat next to each other and that was great. But now like um, we have like uh, our Zoom call and we're like, oh, everybody have their special coffee cup next morning. And then like we have our bubble heads, you know, like we had, a, we had Barack Obama and we had, a, you know, Joe Biden show up and Mary has... Statue of Liberty and I have Yoda. <laughs> so, you know, we, we look forward to doing this because we're going to change the world and we have to have mental health and stamina to do that because it's hard. And um, we, we draw it from each other. And, you know, I see that in Canyon Dems. You know, I, in Canyon Dems, I see a group that lifts each other up, that works together in a, in a cause uh, that we all believe in. And it's a, that's where I think the, the power comes from is, is the working together. And, um, you know, sometimes that's really hard in a big group, but I see you guys seem to have mastered that. So well, any other Melissa, yeah. Melissa, 
I wanted to ask you how do you how are you revising your campaign in light of the uh, COVID restrictions, and how do you envision it going between from now to November? What what's in your eyes? Well, we don't know, but we are planning um, a campaign which will not have any face to face contact in the event that that's necessary. Um, and we're working with the assembly Dems on that. And so um, I have been coming um, very, I, I have my little ring light, right? I have my, I have a microphone, right? And I've been doing town halls with local electeds almost, or and with statewide electeds almost as a practice for a fundraiser. So just today we're setting fundraisers. Um, and we have one uh, with Monique Limon, who is the vice chair of the Women's Legislative Caucus in Sacramento. And we're combining that with Emily's List in NARAL. We're going to do a big call. Um, and like, for example, Assembly Member Laura Friedman, um, we're doing a fundraiser with her. And we don't even know. It might be in L.A. with all of our celebrity friends or it might be online. I mean, we really have to be that nimble. We'll just set the date and see what we can do. Now, we've actually been able to be more active in the community uh, under COVID because it, it, say this was a normal year, right? And we're in April or May and you can't knock on someone's door and talk to them about the November election because they're not thinking about it, right? But we are able to actually serve our community. And so we have a phone bank uh, for seniors, for example, and we're calling seniors in our district and we're gonna set up one in Chinese this coming week. And then we have one set for Spanish and we're reaching out and saying, how are you? Do you have all these resources? What, how can we help you? And so it's actually just giving a preview of what I would be like as their state legislature, how I approach service. And so that's actually been a benefit you know, if we're looking at it from a, from a, a campaign side. So um, also being able to get out in the community and literally serve the community, serving farm workers their lunch. We've, we've done that uh, twice now. And uh, I just came today from the hospital, Kaiser Hospital, where we donated 6,000 masks and over a thousand face shields to um, Kaiser in Irvine and San Canyon. So these are things that we would not really be able to get out. We'd be going like maybe a ribbon cutting, right? But this is so powerful and impactful. And it, it really, to me, is about what we would be doing if we were elected. And that's right in my wheelhouse anyway. I mean, it's, I would much rather show you how I can serve rather than tell you. So it's been, Statement. <laughs> well, you know, and I think the best way to get people run is to inspire them, you know, and to say, and, and to put ourselves up and say, if you run, I will run your campaign. Or if you run, I will walk precincts for you. Or if you run, you know, I'll watch your kids. Right. Because whatever it takes, whatever yeah. it takes. And I know um, the biggest obstacle I've heard from uh, younger women younger than myself has been, you know, hey, I, I have children. And so it's very important to me that every event that we have, every meeting that we have is a complete children loved zone. And I, I have a big uh, chest filled with toys. And I've told um, volunteers on my campaign before that like, if you're, if, if somebody's kid is, you know, needs watching, you're gonna do it. It's usually my son who I appoint as the child watcher, but you know, you're gonna do it. It's somebody who of course likes children preferably, but we, we need to make room for everyone. And just because you are of breeding age, right? Or have young children, doesn't mean that you are out of the, out of the political dialogue. As a matter of fact, those are the people that we really need to have. The two um, heroes in the, um, Congress have been Linda Sanchez on this issue and our own Katie Porter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She says over and over again how, how Congress was not built for people with children. And that's not mm -hmm. okay. And we had a call with Betty yesterday and we talked about um, how 
we're really going to be looking at vulnerable communities and an economy that works better for workers and um, how we would get there. And we both agreed that the best way to get there is to elect more women. Right. Absolutely. We bring everyone to the table with us. So when, when we're, you know, pulling up a chair to the table, we also pull up a high chair, right? And one for grandma and grandpa too. So we bring mm -hmm. everyone to the table with us and we're talking about what we can do to help whole communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's been great. Well, yeah. and I have the resources that are um, the handouts that I gave um, that should be in the chat or somewhere. We've shared it in the chat several times. Melissa, thank you so, so much for spending your time with us tonight. We really appreciate it. And thank remember, you. if you need me, if you need, uh, or you just want to learn, you know, uh, fundraising or anything, just give me a call. I'm here. Awesome. Um, the next time.